Governor Reagan uh, has these big signs in Los Angeles, which you'll be seeing soon here, which he supervised himself. They're a picture of Pat O'Brien as Newt Rockney. And, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, of course, the guys that are putting these signs up are too young to remember the glory of this, you know. And it says, Let, Republican National Committee wants you to win one for the Gipper. That's what it says, which is spelled on the first sign, G-E-E-Z-E-R. <laughs> which must be a mistake. Or, <laughs> or sabotage at a very high level. There's a speech in here by Reagan to the veterans of foreign wars. And is a picture of him. This is a color picture of Governor Reagan. And he says... <laughs> He says, I don't mind. He, he says in here that Vietnam is okay, we should be in it. So the winning of the last war is his ploy here. And, uh, <laughs> he said, and Jimmy Carter said, you know, when he spoke the other night, when he uh, accepted his party's nomination, much to the surprise of some of us in the booth, there's a lot of suspense. He said, uh, Reagan wants war. Then Reagan, of course, answered immediately by saying, no, I hate all wars, having been witness to most of them. He knows the havoc that they can... <laughs> anyway, so, and he's running with uh, George Bush, who is former uh, CIA official. Who's that nun in the corner? George Bush, you know, taking information. And then, and, uh, and Carter, of course, is running with a clone of Humphreys uh, named Mondale. So, uh, and uh, John Anderson, uh, uh, who looks like a skunk in the Disney cartoons. Looks like, doesn't he? Very fine. Well, but it's for the liberals. I mean, the liberals have to have something too, you know. They're the ones who go around at cocktail parties and say, uh, well, the country's really unmanageable. You know, it's like a rogue elephant. And do you think any one man can handle a job? Those are the kind of things that they say. Uh, John Connolly is probably going to be in Reagan's cabinet. You might as well start anticipating some of this. And um, Connolly is... Uh, uh, the Connolly's one contribution is he believes that they should pass legislation to limit the president to uh, one six-year term. Once the president limited limited to one term, which the Central Intelligence Agency has often done, but we don't. We're not no, not tonight. We're not going into that tonight. Yeah, that's right. That's just to let you know I haven't changed. But, anyway, in the meantime, I know that if a lot of you were talking to me on a one-to-one, -one, and many people were out on the street here. Uh, you'd, uh, you'd probably be asking me, you know, what are you doing, you know? Uh, what do you do to stay alive? I write movies. But uh, in addition to that, you know, I like to work a lot because it's fun to talk to people. It is now, for that matter. And, and uh, so I try to, you know, renew that every once in a while. It's nutritive, in other words, as they say, in holistic medicine. So when I work, sometimes I can't choose the places I worked. For instance, I worked in Las Vegas from 1973 to 1976. I lived there. And I worked in the Hilton Hotel, and I worked in a lounge called the Vestal Virgin Lounge. And uh, it was built by Baron Hilton, who was a graduate of Cornell Motel School. And uh, he, uh, anyway, I asked him what a Vestal Virgin was, and he said he learned in a university in grad school in history. Uh, they were girls in, in Greece who uh, maintained their chastity until they met a Greek god or a corporation executive. Anyway, so, <laughs> well, listen. There's no premium on chastity. I'm just an old-fashioned guy, you know, <laughs> just a born sucker for love. Anyway, so uh, I worked in this joint and uh, had a good job there. I had a great job. It was six days a week, and I would talk for 30 minutes. And I'd never been in Vegas in 20 years of performing, but I think they put me in there because Watergate had made everyone aware. That's what. Uh, that's a quote from Baron Hilton. So <laughs> you remember Watergate, don't you? Well, you're supposed to put it behind you, Carter says. But uh, more, and more of that momentarily. The uh, uh, Watergate was a scandal for which I myself hold as Senator McGovern responsible. In that, if Nixon had run uh, unopposed, he would have been defeated, right? So, right? Good. So anyway, so I'm working in Vegas, right? And I don't gamble, and uh, I don't chase those, those girls in the line, and because uh, that's wrong, you know, as a new, women are emerging with a new consciousness. And uh, <laughs> so... Uh, liberals, liber that's all for your bumper sticker. So, uh, bumper sticker philosophy of liberals. So, I, I didn't do any of that, you know, it's hard to kill time, I don't drink either. So, uh, I thought, uh, I know what to do for three years. So, um, I sat around and felt sorry for myself for a couple of days, and I thought to myself, 
this is a, a golden opportunity I'm missing to learn my craft. So what I did was I'd finish my two shows at 11 o'clock, and then I'd go around and I'd watch the Masters of Entertainment in Las Vegas. So I'd go to see people like Wayne Newton and uh, uh, Paul Anka, you know. So it's great. You go into these hotels, you know, and there's a captain there, you know. One of those guys used to work like at Fax, you know, or three bimbos, and, or, or the Venetian room. And uh, they take your money, you know, and they show you a choice table. And then they, uh, you sit on these long tables, about 28 deep, and they bring you this roast beef they put on a plate with a spray gun, you know. And, uh, and a lot of tin foil that you hope a baked potato is in, instead of a melted Hershey bar, right? And, uh, and you sit there and you, uh, you watch some guys sing, you know. You watch your guys sing there. And uh, they come out and uh, guys like Newton and all those guys, they come out and they uh, usually come out dressed very well, you know, crushed velour, brown tuxedos. And then as the exertion begins to take its toll of, their, uh, uh, of the moisture in their body, they take off their coats to, to demonstrate their exertion, and they take off their ties. And the people ring them a stool and tea. And then they talk about their mothers and fathers, and they introduce their conductor, you know. And uh, they sing about 30 or 40 songs, and none of the songs are about, uh, well, you remember when uh, people in the rock business were singing protest songs, politically oriented. Then after that, there was a lot of pa uh, sexually passive songs, you know. Uh, help me make it through the night. I ship my body to Tulare. I can't last another day without you. A very non-masculine, you know, very dependent. So, there was a lot of those songs. And then Frank Sinatra still sings heterosexual songs uh, based on women letting him down, his hour of need. So, uh, Wayne Newton and all these guys that I used to patronize, my favorites there, they sang songs about their personal integrity. It's about their relationship with themselves. There isn't room for a girl. <laughs> and they sing, uh, I gotta be me, and uh, I did it my way. They sing all those songs. And uh, those, these guys have got tremendous integrity. You know, I'd be willing to march into hell for an impossible dream. So uh, they articulate that, and I suppose it's a good idea, because if you didn't uh, hear those lyrics, just looking at them when you walk in, you might get a, a snap impression, albeit erroneous, uh, that their bourgeois and have materialistic values. So be wrong so then uh, then they finish and then when they finish they always say this no matter what night you go in they say uh, I'm supposed to get off and let you people into the casino but you've all been so fantastic that I don't want to get off so usually somebody will jump up in the audience you know from one of those uh, swinging single junkets from Rollins Wyoming get up and they'll say if you don't feel like getting off don't get off because it's far too much conformity in our society as it is so Really, that's the way Vegas is now. So then they sing 40 or 50 more songs about their integrity. So uh, what occurred to me is most of these guys work an hour and a half or two hours. And I think that uh, entertainers, if you don't mind my saying so, uh, I hope you're not in the trade union movement. But it's, I don't want to sound a lot like a Reagan disciple, but I can't help agreeing with them. Entertainers uh, work harder than they have to, and that's to their credit. Uh, in industry, you don't find two people who work longer than they have to. I mean, if you transpose Wayne Newton's values, let's take a random sample. Uh, let's say you go into a, uh, an assembly plant of the Ford Motor Company in Dearborn, Michigan, and a guy, uh, you know, the whistle blows and a lathe operator quits. I think it would be very rare, there might occasionally be an outstanding guy, but I think it would be rare you'd see a lathe operator go to his first line supervisor and say, let me make one more Pinto. You know? <laughs> Because I gotta be me. So, uh, oh, I had a terrible time up there. Did you see what I go through to reach you? Three years. Anyway, and I was also in Washington last year, up until last year. I was on the radio there for NBC. I did a live radio program from Washington, which is the Fourth Reich, I might add. And uh, a great city. I finally left it and came back to the United States with no regrets, mostly because I couldn't vote. And uh, not that it, I guess I suppose a lot of you are feeling at this point uh, that it doesn't do that much good. I saw the president at the convention, at the, uh, <laughs> the convention was sensational. First of all, did you, you noticed on the floor that when Dorothy Bush was taking the, uh, uh, calling the role, that the liberals kept saying, Madam Chairperson of Indeterminate Sexuality, in an effort not to offend anybody. So, and you noticed that it was predetermined. The Kennedy people groused a lot. But it's a long way from my first convention. My first convention was in 1960 in Los Angeles. And at that time, I was at the Hungry Eye. 
and I went down there and worked for the network. And at that time, it was far different. In those days, they used to they used to call the role alphabetically, and they'd yell Alaska, and a guy would get up and he'd pull his delegation. He'd say, Alaska casts its six sevenths of a vote uh, for the next president of the United States, Senator Ted Gravel. And a bunch of girls would come out with straw hats and pom poms and yell, Gravel, 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 Gravel. And then they'd go back up to the booth, you know, and Eric Severide would analyze that. And, uh, and very... <laughs> well, uh, Gravel is ahead, but it's too early to say. Remember? Sure. They tried to get suspense into it, but of course, uh, you know, that's all gone now. Uh, we, don't, we don't have much of that anymore. And uh, so the, uh, the peanut farmer arrived at the last convention. Oh, by the way, Carter had his first reception after he won. He took his uh, wife, you saw on television, to the stage delicatessen, followed by the Secret Service men talking into their cufflinks. And, uh, <laughs> he, uh, and uh, they kept asking about his brother. And uh, his brother testifies next week, how fortuitous in public to the Senate and uh, he uh, the brother is fascinating the moral issue is should Billy Carter be held responsible for the utterances of his brother that's the first one the uh... well the, the yeah the brother's on the brother's unbelievable his uh, uh, no intellectual he you've come a long way from Kennedy's brother uh, to Carter's brother Carter is a uh, did you read the remark today when he got off the plane? He went to see Birch Bay and Strom Thurmond when he got off the plane tonight. On that 7 o'clock news, network news, when he got off the plane in Georgia at Atlanta, they said to him, uh, <clears throat> did the Libyans try to influence you? And he said, uh, the point is they didn't uh, influence the president. Then they got to Birch Bay, and Birch Bay said, they tried to brainwash Billy. <laughs> <laughs> A light rinse would have done it. Does he think? That's what I was going to say. It's unbelievable. No shame. No shame. So what was the big deal between the two conventions? Well, Reagan would not go along with the ERA. That was very big with the liberals. He wouldn't do anything uh, for the women. And, uh, and uh, he ended with a prayer. Does anybody know what Reagan's religious affiliation is? Uh, Carter, I happen to know, is a Baptist who was born again. Question is, if you were born again, why would you come back as Jimmy Carter? That's the first question. <laughs> If you got a second chance on God. That's not as important as he's a born-again Christian who vetoed federal funds for abortion. In case you want to be born the first time. See, it's, it's, a, it's a biological joke. So, have, we haven't had really anybody far out, you know, since Adlai Stevenson, who was a Unitarian. And uh, we pray to whom it may concern. If you... <laughs> If you want to, if you want to drive a Unitarian out of the neighborhood, if you're a bigot, you know, you go to his house and you burn a question mark in the front lawn. <laughs> Remember that. Anyway, we've come a long way, is all I can tell you. Uh, we have come a, a hell of a, a hell of a long way. Although uh, Carter seems to be uh, well acquainted, he knows all the Rockefeller people, and he, he seems to come up with people like uh, Brezhnevsky today, uh, S Secretary Muskie who doesn't know what the nuclear strategy of the country is, the Secretary of State, he suggested a foreign service academy. So they don't, he said they don't get fly-by-night sensations in the State Department. So Cyrus Vance is a dropout from that academy, you may recall. And, uh, but he's, he's acquainted with um, those kind of people. Reagan is acquainted, of course, um, with a, uh, a different kind of person. It's funny, though, you know, people stopped laughing as Reagan got closer. I remember when he, uh, when he ran for governor, I was working up here then. I was perpetually working up here. When he ran for governor, Governor Brown's father, and this will become apropos momentarily, trust me here. Governor, <laughs> governor Brown's father saw the polls. He saw that Reagan was a, a million ahead of him. So he went on NBC television and he held up a picture of Abraham Lincoln. And he said, before you vote for Reagan, remember that an actor killed this man. <laughs> so, so, uh... <laughs> Reagan got equal time from the network, and he, he said it was mudslinging and vicious, and then no one had ever referred to him in that manner prior to that, as an actor. So, <laughs> I was like, well, of course, what else? Anyway, let me tell you how I got to talk to the president. Anyway, let me tell you how I got to talk to the president. See, I knew the president when he was the governor of Georgia, and I met him in Louisiana when he was the governor of Georgia. When he was there, a, uh, a guy was in... The, uh, a guy named Lieutenant Kelly. This is going far back now for the young folks. Um, he was arrested through some kind of a crazy bureaucratic mess. Uh, 
he was arrested and placed in a stockade at Fort Benning, Georgia, on the basis that he had committed some atrocities in Vietnam, allegedly. And, uh, you know, when you consider that we had 600,000 men there for 14 years, it doesn't seem to me a bad record at all that one man, uh, you know, got into an administrative problem with the Vietnamese. So Jimmy Carter felt the same way, the deer hunter notwithstanding. And uh, Jimmy, an apocalypse, Jimmy Carter um, then was governor of Georgia and he, uh, uh, he declared a holiday, Lieutenant Cali Day. And uh, he closed the banks and the schools. Now I'm really closing the banks, I realize, but, uh, and doesn't open them the next day necessarily. Somebody said there should be a sign on his desk that says the half a buck stops here. So, you know who the, his head of, uh, the head of the economic advisors to Reagan, Alan Greenspan, is Barbara Walters' boyfriend, if you're only into gossip. And he, uh, he gave Reagan all the theory, you know, that uh, the economy would pick up. Did you read that statement by Reagan? He said, when the economy goes so far down, it has to come back up. <laughs> this was demonstrated to Reagan. It's called Reagan's Law. And this was... This was demonstrated to Reagan by Alan Greenspan. He, uh, in a, he dropped a, an apple out of a tree to Reagan. Reagan grabbed it and he noticed as he released his grip on the fruit, it fell back into the tree. That's when he knew that capitalism could be saved. We never understood that in Berkeley. But uh, anyway, so Ray, uh, this is uh, kind of fascinating. Anyway, let me tell you about Carter. So uh, Carter, uh, Lieutenant Cowley was put into the, uh, uh, into the stockade at Fort Benning. President Nixon, feeling that a lot of the middle class liked Cali, President Nixon, President Nixon took Cali out and put him in a Holiday Inn in Columbus, Georgia, to get his brains together. He was under house arrest. It was in People magazine. You might have seen it. Ever see People? Good magazine, you know. Not too demanding, you know. <laughs> Can read it before the light turns green. And <laughs> so, way up in that. So, Cali. Um, then the army, making this poor lieutenant a pawn, sent him to the, uh, found him guilty and sent him to Leavenworth for his life. And Nixon took him out of Leavenworth, put him on appeal, put him in a Holiday Inn, Leavenworth, Kansas. So then Nixon got bounced, you remember? And Gerald Ford, a man who was termed by the paper, innately decent. <laughs> Ger Gerald Ford came forward and became the president, intermittently, uh, caretaker president, they called him, I think, the press. And... Uh, Cali was then resentenced uh, by the army, and by that time his case had gone, and uh, he finally got out. People wonder about that. The army sentenced him to live in the Holiday Inn for the rest of his life, <laughs> and he then appealed, saying that that was cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> Seems fair, huh? Okay. Now where were we? Oh, let me tell you what I'm doing now, just for fun. You know, it's kind of heart to heart. I started uh, writing pictures about four years ago when I'm not performing. And uh, the picture business is uh, excellent. Uh, what you do is uh, <clears throat> you write pictures, and you usually write them for stars who can't make up their minds. And uh, then they give it back to you. That's called a turnaround clause, legally. And then you go to another star who can't make up his mind, who is competitive with the first star, who feels he can do it better. Then he becomes frightened and decides not to do it, and you go on. I've been living on one picture for uh, four years. <laughs> I'll tell you the picture. You might as well know. I, uh, I had written a uh, picture, it's, uh, it's kind of a documentary, I figured it would be good if people could relate to it in a true to life sense, because the audiences are very alert now, thanks to the influx of foreign films. I mean, there are no taboos. So, I wrote this movie based on Jerry Lewis going to Vegas to start his telethon every year for his kids, and uh, any of you have left your change at the 7-Eleven store, I don't have to explain what that is. So, so Jerry Lewis gets there and it's the night before the telethon, and there's a knock on the door, and Jerry Lewis go, answers it. And there's this intellectual there with these rimless glasses, and he says, uh, Mr. Lewis, says, yeah, he says, I'm Dr. Leonard Fellman of Cedars sinai in Los Angeles, and I have a cure for the disease. So, uh, <laughs> you like it, huh? So Lewis kills him. <laughs> so, uh, so I sold that picture to uh, Warner Brothers with Lewis to play himself, but they, did, they, uh, uh, they didn't make it with him, and then I, I worked intermittently for uh, Clint Eastwood. <laughs> Honest. Paul Newman, who asked me to rewrite it, about, so that we show something about uh, physical impropriety of our prisons. It's a liberal. 
And then the last thing I did was make it into a two-hour movie of the week for television to star John Ritter. So there'll be some dancing in it now. So uh, I've been living on this for four years. I don't think it'll ever get made. And uh, each time I sell it, I get more. So I want you to know that the reason this country can survive Carter and Reagan is that it's still possible to fail upward. That's what I was going to. But, uh, yeah, it really is. It really is unbelievable, isn't it? It just goes on, and the young people keep paying five dollars to go to the movies. Kind of incredible. Meanwhile, Ralph Nader is running around saying the only answer is not to exhale. That's all going on in Washington, right? Fascinating. Anyway, now where was I? Those were all by way of uh, preface remarks, you know, of what I what I really want to talk to you about. Let me tell you about the convention when I got to New York. Time Magazine. Remember Time? Time has this big, big reception. Uh, for Carter, and it took place in the afternoon after he went to the delicatessen, and it took place at this big apartment that Mrs. Luce, who lives in Honolulu, the widow of Henry Luce, has on Park Avenue. So I went to it with no hope of talking to the president, but I had a press badge, and I walk in, and it was exciting. Everybody was there, Avril Harriman and all, uh, you know, the various movie stars who were Democrats, Lauren Bacall, and uh, all these people that uh, worked for Carter along the way, Henry Fonda and Governor Kerry of New York, and uh, Mayor Koch, and uh, you just got the feeling, you know, that if a bomb fell on that building, that maybe America would get off to a fresh start. It was all there. <laughs> so, I walk in, and uh, the president is surrounded by all these people. The president is surrounded by all these people, and, uh, and uh, I didn't figure I'd get anywhere near him. Bob Strauss and that whole bunch, and uh, Oddly enough, somebody was telling a joke about him in a corner from the Texas delegation, some drunk, saying that uh, Carter was as great as Christopher Columbus in that uh, when, he, when he set out on his journey, he didn't know where he was going. When he got back, he didn't know where he'd been. <laughs> but he didn't know that the trip was at government expense. <laughs> so, now, I just did the Merv Griffin show with Gore Vidal, who thinks he's Oscar Wilde. Now, it's very interesting. You've got Gore Vidal. Uh, Gore Vidal is a sexual libertine, and uh, Merv Griffin is a liberal. <laughs> so, uh, Merv Griffin says to Vidal, why do you live in Rome? And he said, uh, Vidal said, because America is dominated by a, a middle class, and it's a sexual dictatorship, heterosexual dictatorship. So Merv, in the manner of all liberals, said, I know, you know. Hit me again. <laughs> And again, it doesn't feel good, but it feels familiar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Liberals love to be punished. And, uh, and a lot of people love to punish them for the wrong reasons. So, anyway, Merv, uh, Merv talked about, actually, America is not a, a, a heterosexual dictatorship. We're the greatest country in the world about sexuality, regardless, as Holcomb you read, by various lobbying minorities. We are fantastic. We're unbelievable. Consider the case. I just limited to Oscar Wilde and Vidal. Oscar Wilde was a great writer. And he's a man who said, a cynic knows uh, the price of, of everything and the value of nothing. He's a great, great writer. When it was determined that Oscar Wilde's sexual preference was homosexual, the British put him in chains in a dungeon, running water chains, left him there. We would never do that. This is a great country. Hold your applause. It's a great country. I mean, you'll never see, when Truman Capote is on The Tonight Show, or Vidal for that matter, you'll never see United States Marshals come in. You know, say, stand up, Capote, you know, chains, we're going to throw you in a dungeon. You might like them, but they won't do it. They won't do it. That's the point. They won't do it. And uh, you've got quite a list there that we've let work unfettered. Tennessee Williams, William Inge, Edward Albee, James Costigan, uh, James Kirkwood, James Leo Hurley, uh, Gore Vidal, the aforementioned Truman Capote, <clears throat> and we should distinguish Oscar Wilde. The other guys are great homosexuals, and he was a great writer. <laughs> it's a, it takes a lot of time. One Thursday night, I remember it was a Thursday, because I was looking forward to the weekend, because I needed money to pay my bills. This young man comes down, he's about 390 pounds, and he said, Hey, listen, he said, I have a guy upstairs, he said, that I'd like to audition for your club. 
he's a comic and uh, he's really very funny and we're going back to Los Angeles and I'd like him to do it tonight it'd be all right if I brought him in audition for you I said well really I, I don't know about comics I just hire musicians and singers I I don't deal in comics and he said well you got to hear this guy he's really very very funny I said okay really nice and by the way I want to tell you he said he just got out of the veterans hospital with malnutrition and a ruptured appendix and I'm just taking him home to recuperate so he'll be a little bit weak and shaky on his pins but Enrico just uh, didn't have the heart to tell him that he couldn't uh, that he couldn't use him I don't think I've ever told anybody I didn't think he was so great I didn't look at him and say oh boy this guy is gonna be fantastic he's gonna be the greatest going to I really looked at him as a poor kid he looks so skinny and hungry and uh, I thought what $75 a week he can't hurt the place and I and Larry Tucker, who brought him down, this was Larry Tucker who had brought him down. I saw him at the edge of the bar looking at him, isn't he great, isn't he great? And I'm saying, yeah, yeah, he's all right. He says, well, uh, what do you think, what do you think? The audience was kind of a, okay, bring on Stan Wilson. They didn't want to hear any more and more. Suddenly, out of Berkeley, this uh, Jewish intellectual with uh, blue jowls and uh, uh, a sweater and no necktie and a rolled up newspaper walks on stage, you know, spritzing away, rap, 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 saying things that uh, people like me were only comfortable saying in the privacy of our living rooms and then if we were only very sure of our friends or our family because he was saying things that were scaring the bejesus out of everybody. And all of the palace guard came up to Enrico and said, uh, Enrico, you gotta get this commie uh, snot nose out of here because uh, the FBI is coming down and asking questions. And Enrico said, yeah, 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 well, you know, we'll just give him another week. He was working 75 a week or something. Suddenly, Enrico looks up, there are lines around the block. Oh, yeah. Time magazine wants to do a story. Uh, all of the uh, butcher paper liberal weeklies are catching on to this guy who's coming in and saying things like, I'm teaching my children about Joe McCarthy at home because I don't want them to find out about him in the street. And so I think the reason the Hungry Eye became what it became and why it was so widely copied it, it, that in the uh, Eisenhower, McCarthy, Nixon era in the early 50s, that it was the springboard of dissent. You didn't find it in the legitimate theater, you didn't find it in the novel, you didn't find it on a television, you didn't hear it on the radio. But I think that the Hungry Eye and the spin-offs of the Hungry Eye were the first signs of an opposition to Cold War conformity. Uh, when I had my blackboard back at the Hungry Eye, I called them the Social Democrats. Uh, you all know who they are. Uh, they're people that worry about whales and uh, <laughs> the atmosphere and Indians and women and uh, Eskimos. And, uh, they'll, liberals are usually people you could define as those who would do the right things for the wrong reasons so that they can feel good for 10 minutes at a time. Now, uh, what they brought you is Jimmy Carter and, uh, and in a sense, Ronald Reagan. That's the choice. And uh, so what you've got is uh, you have a country where you used to have 4 million people at the time of the Revolutionary War, and you have the collected intellect of Jefferson and Tom Paine and Samuel Adams Patrick Henry and Ben Franklin and George Washington and now you have 225 million and you have the <laughs> so <laughs> what do you make of this besides the fact that Darwin was wrong it's, well, it's, I was on the Tonight Show recently and uh, uh, Johnny Carson was not there it's part of his new deal you know he's just signed a multi-billion dollar deal with NBC in which he does not have to be on the program <laughs> But he has to watch it. So, so I go on a Tonight Show and I'm on there with John Davidson. <laughs> right? With the hairspray. He'd make a great newsman, wouldn't he? I bet. $35 haircut and a 15 cent head and that. Yeah. Right? And the dimples. The dimples. So uh, Davidson comes on. He talks to you in the third person, you know. He says, Is Mort Saul afraid of anything? You know? <laughs> I may take myself seriously, but still. Uh, so, I can only take so much responsibility being a, a guru. So, uh, this guy's really a square. I mean, John Davidson, he couldn't swing if you hung him. I mean, this guy is... Uh, I know. So, so, we're sitting there, and he says to me, we're talking, and uh, 
we're going back and forth to commercials. You know, Carson runs that thing. That's his annuity. He runs it with a steel glove. The producer, Fred de Cordova, stands there with signs just out of camera range and tells people, kill that subject matter. Go to a commercial. Or this is fine milking. That person's through. You know, like that. That's why you see people after commercial, they, they've died. They're not in the human race anymore. <laughs> so we're doing a show. And uh, he opens up and he's got Sammy Davis on, right? And uh, <clears throat> Sammy Davis is there, right? And he says, he's Jewish, but he's black. He's explaining to Davidson. His best friend is Angela Davis, and he voted for Nixon. He's going like that. And a very confused person. So, so I listen to him, and he says, Frank Sinatra's the greatest American he ever met. So, <laughs> so Frank Sinatra and you have to. So then, then, uh, then they, finish, they finish with that, and then they have Wayne Newton, one song, I've got to go back to Vegas. It was the mic the Doc Severinsen. Doc Severinsen was over there, right? That suit made from the Chanel spread off a bed in Tijuana motel, right? So, plays good, but no, you know, so I'm watching it. And uh, John Davidson is the only living heart donor for that matter, but that's all right. So, and they're giving him all these signs, right? Now, when they go to commercial, they swarm over his desk like a pit crew, and they tell him what to do, right? So they say, You've got six minutes. They've got an author in the green room. They bring on the author at the end because they figure if you don't have a book, you know, when do you write a book? Once every five years? They feel an author won't do what they want and will say something terrible on the tape. So what they want is they bring you on way at the end to minimize risk because they figure they can't blackmail you. So I say, we're going to bring on the author now. So it says, here's the book. Hold up the book. So Davidson looks at the book, he says, I haven't read this. He says, don't worry about it. We'll give you the questions on the card, right? So the author is Kate Millett, who's been in Iran. So Kate Millett walks on, right? She's been kept there for an hour and 44 minutes. She's angry, but she's angry anyway. Feminist leader. It's like the black movement. They're all leaders. So she walks out, walks out with a cigarette, obviously hasn't read the warning on the side of the package. And she, they introduce her to everybody on the panel, you know, and to, to, to uh, Ed McMahon, who's still laughing, you know. <laughs> in case Johnny has said anything funny at home and, <laughs> and me, right? We're all shaking hands and, uh, and Sammy Davis, J.R. So, so I'm sitting here, right? And uh, she sits down with John Davidson and he, he looks at the book like this He looks at a book like he'd want to put it in a pail of cold water <laughs> So he says He says, uh I must confess, I have not read your book. So there was a, a real hush fell over the audience, you know, because most of us could not believe there's a book in print that John hasn't completed. <laughs> I read your book. So she says, I'm in, so uh, she says, uh, I want to ask you a question. He says, what is it? Shoot, he says. So she says, <clears throat> why is it that if a, a male homosexual comes on the air, you talk about his work, but if a female homosexual came on the show, you would talk about her sexual proclivities. <laughs> so I look at him, and he looks up at the board. You know. <laughs> so, so they say, go to a commercial. <laughs> so they go to a commercial, and it shows, you know, these two older people living in Miami eating dog food, and uh, whatever. And then they come out of the commercial, and uh, she says to him, I suspect that the answer to that question is rhetorical. It's because you've got a middle-class audience, you're still doing a 1948 program. You don't want to rock the boat. She says, if you had a male homosexual on, you're talking about his work, female homosexual, so they write him a note. They say, tell her it's academic. So he says, well, it's academic. We've never had a female homosexual on the program. So she says, you have now. <laughs> So I look at his eyes, you know, and, and they look like a machine in Vegas, you know, bar, bar, lemon. So uh, I look up at the monitor and, and Tom Snyder is there. We're not on. I look up at the monitor and Tom Snyder is talking to Eldridge Cleaver and he says, what did you Panthers really want? He says, your head. And Tom Snyder says, all right, sir. Let me get back to that after these messages. 
Just put your torch in this umbrella stand. <laughs> Tom Snyder. When did you first know you're a man in a woman's body, sir? <laughs> and uh, Tom Snyder, right? <clears throat> Listen, Pope, you know, I went to Catholic school, too. <laughs> I'm looking at... So we're, <laughs> so we're off the air. We're off the air, and they adjourn all backstage. There's a, a little conference room, you know? And you go in, there's water and those little pads and pencils. And I walk in and there's John Davidson's lawyer. I must have called him while we're on the air. And his agent and his personal manager. And over on the other side is Fred DeCardo, the producer. And uh, uh, um, uh, Johnny Carson's lawyer, Arnold Bushkin. He's over there. And a guy from the network, this punk, is there. He's about 12. He's standing there. And he says, uh, you know, uh, this, you'll never work again in this town. And Johnny, if Johnny saw this show, you'd just be uh, pray that Johnny didn't see the show. And everything. See, you know me. I love lost causes. You remember me? So uh, I said to the court of it, the producer, I said, what's the matter? He says, well, he says, you were out there. He says, didn't you? He said, we tried to bleep it. I hope we were in time. You know, he said, lesbian in the air. I said, yeah, I know. So he says, uh, well, you can't say that on the air. So uh, I said, why? So he says, because we've got a middle class audience and we defend their sensibilities. <laughs> I said, really? So he says, yeah, this is not a nightclub, you know, where you get up and curse. So I want you to know where television is coming from. Isn't that the example, what they think of, that, of the audience? The audience, of course, they're referring to as us. They think that's going to bother us. Right? Whether she said, you have a female homosexual in the program, or at the, the chiding of John Davidson, she said, I'm a practicing lesbian. Uh, that's going to upset us. Now remember what we've been through here. We went to Vietnam for 14 years, cost $171 million, billion, 50,000 dead, 300,000 casualties, and uh, we lost. <laughs> Came in second. Is that better? <laughs> <laughs> then Angola, right? Then uh, after that, we had we went through the whole period of the campus. Remember, you're running around comparing notes with your friends. You say, "My kid's a Mooney. Yeah, my kid's a junkie. Well, my kid's in the CIA. Same kid. Remember? <laughs> yes, he went through. Then we went through the assassinations. He did do it. He didn't do it. He had an accomplice. He didn't do it. There's another bullet. There's another killer. There's another guy. There's another police department. There's another president. We went through that whole thing. Right? Got through all that. Then we got through the campus is on fire. The campus is on fire. Democratic Party beating kids in the street in Chicago. Hubert Humphrey. Hubert Humphrey. Give him a chance. Mend the party. Unification. Then we went uh, through all that. Then we had Nixon. Then Nixon quit. Nixon's got 47 lawyers on staff are arrested. 34 go to jail making license plates. Right? <laughs> California Bar Association gets embarrassed, institutes an ethics exam, which is multiple choice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nixon is running up and down the beach with his, the, the pants and the blue suit rolled up, his barefoot, the jacket with an eagle on it, running up the beach of St. Cloud, had all that, right? Then the 53 hostages, please let them out, no I won't, no I won't. Then the Shah says, we threw him out, right? Then he keep taking out parts of the Shah and shipping them back as appeasement, it didn't work, remember we went through all that? Left. Then you find out unemployment, they're announced as at 9%, which you can double, means it's at 18%, right? Then they start in, uh, Miami is burning, Miami is burning. And he's like, Chattanooga is burning, Chattanooga is burning. And they said, there's no gas, there's no gas. The Saudi Arabians are mad about Begin moving his bed to the eastern side of the hospital, there's no gas. Then Brown arrives and says, there's no water, there's no water, there's a drought. So you cut back on water, and then he says, there's too much, not people are buying enough water, now there's not enough water, there's too much water. Went through that whole thing, got to all that. Then went through the Pentagon Papers. The papers, they stole the papers. The army is running the country. The army is not running the country. Uh, then uh, when we got all through with that, uh, we found out that the cost of living is going up. Inflation is 24%. That's what the uh, government admits to. And then we finally wound up with the collected intellect of Reagan <laughs> and Carter. Now I ask you, in light of the foregoing atrocities. What's one more lesbian on a Tonight Show? <laughs>